gas laws. Folks, this is probably one of the most practical chapters of the entire year. And we don't have that many chapters left. After this one, we only have three chapters left. And they're relatively short chapters. Okay? Gas laws govern so many parts of our life, down from breathing, gas laws, passing gas, gas laws, burping, gas laws, balloons, gas laws. Okay? Going down, now we're getting, getting warmer, we're thinking, and we're uh, dreaming of getting in the pool, getting, going down deep and feeling that pressure, gas laws. Getting on an airplane and going up in an airplane, gas laws. Popcorn, gas laws. Hot air balloons, gas laws. Internal combustion engine, gas laws. Tire pressure, gas laws. During the winter, we need to put air in our tires. During the summer, we need to make sure we let out some of the air in our tires. Why is that? Gas, gas, gas laws. laws. Oh, look at this girl. She is swimming through an ocean. An ocean of air. Okay, there are a lot of similarities between the ocean and the atmosphere. Okay, except that we are most familiar with the upper reaches of the ocean. We're not as familiar with all the strange creatures that live at the bottom. But we would be the strange creatures living at the bottom of the ocean of air that we call the atmosphere. Here's Steve Fawcett's uh, balloon. He was, he's, I think, the only human being to go on a balloon ride all around the Earth without stopping. He did it once after doing it, trying it several times, and then he died when his balloon went over a desert and lost radio con contact with him and he tried to leave the desert here in America he tried to leave the the southwestern desert on his own didn't make it <laughs> so so he survived going around the earth in a balloon but could not survive getting out of a desert we will look at the properties of gases we will study the gas laws and how they're related to each other we will con construct a model to predict why gases act the way they do and we'll put it all together along with math to make it practical. Today, I can explain the relationships between air pressure and elevation. I can explain how a barometer works. I can convert from one pressure unit to another. What is gas pressure again? Pressure gas. Wow, brilliant, Alec. <laughs> okay, yes. It's the force exerted by uh, moving uh, gas particles bouncing off of you can't feel it, but there are bazillions of air molecules colliding with your skin right now. Actually, our bodies are designed for there to be a bazillion air molecules crashing on your skin. And if we do not have a bazillion air molecules crashing on our skin, hickey. bad things. We get a hickey. We get... Okay, so I'm going to answer like several questions in today's lecture. First of all, what happened to my bottle? Why is it deflated here? Okay. No. We're going to answer what causes a balloon? What causes a balloon to inflate? So, in Battlestar Galactica, what happened to Chief Tyrrell and his aide when they went off into space? If somebody was to kick you out into space, what would happen? What is gas pressure again? A push that molecules exert when they collide against objects. So, I take this balloon and inflate it. Okay, it's inflated now. What has a greater pressure, inside the balloon or outside? Inside, wrong. Outside. Outside, wrong. Equilibrium. Equal. Folks, one of the most important things 
that you're going to learn when you get to physics is that stuff does not move unless there is some force applied to it. So, is there force applied inside the balloon? Yes. Air is pushing out. Is there air pushing in? Yes. It's not moving, so what can we what do we know about the forces? They're equal, right? They're equal. All right? So, how can I make this balloon move again? Is it equal? Was it equal when I was pointing at it? No. Is it equal now? Yeah. Okay, how about... Now? now? Yes. So when it's moving out, who has greater pressure, inside or outside? Outside. When it's moving, when the balloon is expanding, what has greater pressure, inside or outside? Inside. Okay, how about this? Okay, there's two reasons why I do this. Number one, to teach you a scientific principle. Number two, more importantly, it really seems to annoy some people. And I actually enjoy seeing that, seeing their, their, their face. And I think Allison's going to be... Oh, look at Natalie staring daggers into me. She does not like it. Okay, as you hear the sound, what, who has greater pressure, outside or inside? Okay, I'm, I'm decreasing the pressure by doing what? Okay, I'm opening and doing what? I'm decreasing the number of molecules. So why does it make that sound? Because it's the sides of the, of the, uh, of the latex vibrating, that's right. Same principle, guys, you know, when you pass gas. When you pass gas and you make a noise, guess what's actually vibrating or flapping? <laughs> Your butt cheeks. Your butt cheeks. Okay? Yes, Grant knows one of these answers. Don't want to know why. Let's... What device is used to measure gas pressure? It's called a barometer. How does it work? Okay, let's go through it again. There is nothing there. How can there be nothing? There's nothing there. But there has to be something. Yeah, okay, maybe there might be some evaporated mercury, but not many. There's mostly nothing there. So what's pushing the level of mercury down? Gravity. Okay, no. From inside, is there anything? No. Okay, not pushing, not pushing. Gravity's not pushing. But you're right, gravity is pulling down, air pressure is pushing up. Why doesn't it move there? Okay, meteorologists study the changes in distance. They know that when this level begins to decrease, to them that means there's a low pressure system coming. Okay, that means there's a mass of air that does not have as much air, lower pressure. It doesn't mean that there's no air or else we wouldn't be breathing. It means there's less air. Okay, so we know from experience that where a high pressure system where there's a lot of air meets a cold, uh, a low pressure system where there is little air, rain. you've got rain. So when it starts to go down, we know there's rain. When it stops, we know it's going to be probably cooler, but no more rain. When it starts to go up, we know there's going to be rain, and then when it stops, no rain. So whenever it moves up or down, there is a potential for rain because that means that masses of air are switching places. They're, they're moving past us. Okay? If you have a barometer and it goes down rapidly over a short period of time, watch out. Oh, it's not just a storm, it's oh, what? Tornado. tornado. That is tornado weather. What causes air pressure? As molecules are drawn down toward the earth, they will push on the surface and 
anything around it. Great video for explaining this. Let's talk about air pressure. What is air pressure? To learn about air pressure, we must first define what pressure is. Pressure is the effect which occurs when a force is applied to a surface. P equals F divided by A. The force of air is caused by particles in the air being pulled toward the center of the Earth by gravity. Since air is made of stuff, it has mass and weight. Therefore, it creates a pressure due to gravity pulling the stuff toward the center of the Earth. Picture a clear plastic tube going from a spot on Earth to 600 miles above sea level. That is where the atmosphere ends. In other words, there is no more stuff. Now let's fill the tube with eggs. The eggs at the bottom of the tube will have greater pressure on them, causing them to break and become more dense as the eggs now fill all the space in the bottom of the tube. The eggs near the top of the tube have less pressure on them because there are fewer eggs above them. With that picture in mind, you should be able to get an idea of air pressure. The farther from Earth's center you stand, as on Mount Everest, the fewer eggs above you and the less pressure. The closer to the center of the Earth, as in the Sea of Galilee, the more eggs above you and the greater the pressure. We can measure the air pressure using different instruments. We have manometers and barometers. The barometers can be mercury barometers or aneroid barometers. An altimeter is basically an aneroid barometer. One of the most one of the most interesting places in the United States at sea level is Key West, Florida. The elevation of Key West is sea level to a whopping 18 feet on top of Solaris Hill. Air pressure on a standard day in Key West is measured at 29.92 inches of mercury, or 760 millimeters of mercury or 1013.25 millibars. I want you to pay close attention to these videos. I just don't show them to you just to entertain you. I want to answer the question, why did we do as a country so terrible in the 1968 Summer Olympics? On top of Mount Everest in the Himalayan mountains, the altitude is 29,028 feet. That is about five and a half miles high. The air pressure is so low that people who climb Everest usually need to have extra oxygen with them. Woo, I could use that myself. Once again, you have a lower pressure than at sea level because there are fewer air particles above. point in the state of Georgia is a mountain peak called Brasstown Bowl. The elevation is 4,784 feet. Remember, you have a lower pressure than sea level because there are fewer air particles above. Reducing our altitude below sea level, we travel to the Salton Sea in California. The altitude is 220 feet below sea level. 
And since we are below sea level, we have more particles of air stacked above us, hence greater pressure. More stuff means more weight and a greater force. Finally, we are at Lake Kinneret, the Sea of Galilee in Israel. Lake Kinneret is the lowest freshwater lake on Earth and located in the Great Rift Valley. The elevation of the lake is 696 feet below sea level. Because there is more stuff above us, like in the Salton Sea, the pressure is greater. Now that you know the elevations of these locations, use the air pressure versus altitude chart to... Okay, so my question to you is, why did we do so terribly in the 1968 Winter Olympics, uh, Summer Olympics? Well, why is that important? It was up here in Mexico City. <laughs> we did terrible. Wouldn't we do good in our own country? Well, here's the deal. At that time, there wasn't all your lifetime, and really for most of my lifetime, we have had one Olympic training facility in Colorado Springs, up there. That came as a direct result of how terribly we did in the 1968 Olympics. Okay, I'll give you a clue. If we, if we, hold on, go ahead, go ahead. All right, so the reason why we did that is we were really weak to the air pressure up in Colorado Springs. Actually, 19, before 1968, we did not have a national training center. So people would train all over the place, most people down here. Yes? Uh, higher air pressure at a lower altitude means you don't need to breathe as often to get as much oxygen. You get more progressed, and when you're at a low altitude, you have, uh, you'll be winded much quick, much more quickly. Lower altitude? And then higher altitude. Okay. All right, folks, believe it or not, our diaphragm, our lungs, which are made of muscle tissue, do not have to work very hard in order to obtain oxygen. Okay? Why? Because there's a lot of air down here. There is a lot, there's a lot of, there's a higher pressure, lots and lots of air. So we just take, no problem. Esther, when she's swimming, just take some some shallow breaths, she gets plenty of oxygen. If Esther were to become a state champion, we could have her go up to Colorado Springs. She is our number one Tennessee champion. I would take her up to Colorado Springs. I would match her up against a mediocre, a mediocre kid her age. And I would bet against her. Why would I bet against her? Yeah. Cheerfully. We would be afraid that she's going to drown. If she has trained down here for all her life, she is used to taking a small little breath and her lungs get enough oxygen. We match her up against somebody, a mediocre swimmer, that is, you, her lungs are used to having to fight for oxygen. So her diaphragm and her lungs are very muscular, very well developed. She may be more muscular than that girl overall, but she may drown in the middle of that pool. Why, Esther? You're not used, you, your lungs are not used to having such little air. So you would be sitting there gasping for breath halfway through, okay? If we were to be state champions in football, okay, 
again, and we would play a mediocre team from Colorado Springs in Colorado Springs, 7,000, we're down here, 7,000 feet above sea level, would we win? Probably not. Okay? Baseball begins today. Odds are there will be more home runs, more home runs in Colorado, in Denver today, than there will be down in Miami. Why? What's the atmospheric pressure like in Denver? So if you hit a ball, how much air is crashing against that ball? Not as much. Folks, there have been two record-breaking field goals. 65 yards. Both of them happened where? In Denver, Colorado. Okay. As folks, it rules. So we came over in 1968 and we did terrible. Our sprinters were gasping for air, whereas they would simply have no trouble down here. Our long distance runners couldn't finish. And then <laughs> it was one of those things where they brought chemist in and go, well, this is the problem. Well, why didn't you say so? You never asked. Jocks never ask questions of scientists. They don't care. Okay? But if somebody had somebody had thought, hey, Mexico City is up there. Maybe we ought to train up in Colorado Springs. That would have been smart, and we would not have been. So after that, we chose a big city that was very high in elevation. Colorado Springs is 7,000. There are very few big cities that could possibly host a Summer Olympics that would be that high. So when you train that high up, your lungs, your diaphragm are very muscular. You're used to obtaining large gulps of air. So when you come down, no biggie, no biggie. Yes. Wait, so does that mean like people who are always up there and they come down to like zero, they're like super juicy and tan? Well, they just they're able to get more oxygen for less breaths. What is it there? Because they take super breaths. They're used to taking super breaths, so they don't need to breathe as much as people. That if Esther important? was to get no. Olympics quality swimmer at some point you would have to go and start training up there to to expand your your uh, your lung capacity all right so what happens to air pressure as you go up in elevation what happens to air pressure up or down less why okay so there's less air above you so there is less air therefore less pressure all right these are simple little math problems that you can solve they're called open air manometer problems you have a gas here you have atmospheric pressure here they may tell you that the atmospheric pressure is 770 and they want to know what this gas pressure is Actually, all you need to know is the difference here is 30 millimeters, and now you can figure it out. All right, if the pressure here and out here were the same, where would the mercury levels be? Equal. They would be equal. That's right, because they each would be pushing with the same push. But Morgan, they're not equal, are they? Who's winning the battle? Who has greater pressure, air or the gas inside here? How do you know? It has a higher thing. No, no, you don't know what this is. Standard pressure would be the pressure at sea level, the average pressure at sea level. Well, how do they like, put that in there and not make it to sea level? Well, you don't know what's in here. 
So Morgan, look at the mercury. This guy is pushing mercury like this. This guy is pushing mercury like this. Who's pushing it harder? Good. Okay. So whatever is inside of here needs to be less than this. How much less? Well, by how much is the air pressure winning? 30. Okay, so what is this air pressure? If the air pressure is winning by 30, then what is the pressure of the gas? Okay, so 770 minus 30. Thank you. What? Millimeters? Millimeters. We'll, we'll talk about that here in a second. All right, Marie, who's winning this battle? Okay, if this is 30 millimeters, what is the pressure of gas? So, what happens to air pressure as you go into Death Valley? Goes up. Why does air pressure go up? Because elevation goes down, which means there is more or less air. More air. What is air pressure at sea level? 760 millimeters of mercury, one atmosphere, 101.3 kilopascals, 14.7 pounds per square inch. Memorize these numbers. Memorize them. Did you just write that on your worksheet that you're going to turn in? Oh my God. Question. Why so many units? Because, well, mainly to confuse you. Okay, well, you're welcome. All right. Um, why? Why so many units? Gas laws is very, very important to many, many different disciplines. The engineers love PSI, so that's the unit they use. Chemists love atmospheres and kilopascals. Biologists, atmospheres. Okay? Um, physicists would use, may use millimeters. Meteorologists use inches. Or torricellis. Yes? What's a bar? A millibar refers to the distance that the mercury level goes up in a different, it's just a different unit of measure. Do you have to know all these units? Yes. By the way, a tire pressure. What is, what, what is the tire pressure that for most tires you should be inflating it to? What? 24. Nope. 35. 35 is the safest. Don't go much further. Okay. Then 35. Now, during the summer months, should you release some of the air pressure or inflate it? Release. release it. During the winter months, should you release or inflate? Why? It's Charles' law. Actually, it's Gay Lussac's law. Sorry. The pressure of air in a tire is measured to be 28 psi. Represent this pressure in atmospheres, tors, and pascals. If I don't know what to do, 
I draw a train track. Yes. Here, Alec, let me help you. Everything that we do this year will have six digits. See, that's not true. You told me that there was some stuff that didn't have six digits. He lied. He lied. 28 PSI. Okay, what do we put down here in the denominator? PSI. PSI. What do we put up here? Atmosphere. Atmosphere, which is uh, abbreviation of ATM. Now that you've memorized that list, I mean, that has always been amazing to me, folks. That is about a square inch. Imagine every square inch of your body has 15 pounds of pressure on it. That is a lot. Okay? That also explains something that happened in a show that I wouldn't recommend you watch, but it was very intriguing and also scientifically accurate in many ways. And that was a show back in the aughts, I think it was aught six or aught seven, called Battlestar Galactica. Did you see that show? Okay, remember the one where Chief Tyrrell and his girlfriend were caught in a fire? There was a fire inside the ship and they couldn't get, they could not get to these two people in time before the fire sucked up all the oxygen that they were running out of oxygen. So they got a tiny ship on the other side. Remember they opened the hatch and they blew a hole inside on the outside of the ship. First of all, they went straight out the hole. They said that they were sucked into space. Are, were they really sucked They're into not, space? Is not real. Suction is not real, real. There is high pressure here. There is no pressure. So where's the air going to go? Air always moves from high pressure to low pressure. So along with all the air came Chief Tyrrell and his girlfriend. What was his girlfriend's name? I don't remember. They got married. Okay. So, they could not get this ship up against the big ship because once it blew, it was going to damage the little ship. So, they had to get close, but not too close, which means that for a few seconds, Chief Tyrrell and his girlfriend were open to space and no pressure. Now, folks, as I've told you already, our bodies are designed to have 15 pounds of pressure per postage stamp. We have teeny tiny little bubbles. I thought that you were talking about like boats. And I was like, what? We have teeny tiny little bubbles of oxygen that are normally dissolved in our blood. So what happens to the size of these teeny tiny bubbles when you remove the air pressure that's on our skin. They get bigger. We have teeny tiny little capillaries. They're almost microscopic, full of blood. So when those bubbles try to go through the capillaries, they will burst open the capillaries. No, their skin is tough enough. Their skin is tough enough not to crack open and explode. Okay, no, no, basically it was very real, the, very realistic because the next scene they were in a decompression chamber. A, a, that's one of those, they're called hyperbaric chamber. It's a chamber where you can control the air pressure. So they got them in there as quickly as possible and pumped up, pumped low, the, the, made the air pressure very low and then slowly start increasing it in order for them to get back to normal. Within a couple of days, they were talking to them. They were purple people. They used to be white people. Now they were purple people. Their eyes were bloodshot, and their noses were encrusted with blood, and their ears were encrusted with blood. Why? Why were they purple people? 
They had, they had a giant hickey from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. Everywhere there was subdermal hematoma. Their blood vessels, they probably would have had a hard time, probably very blurry vision. Their eyes would have been swollen from all the blood vessels near their eyes popping, their, all the blood vessels in their ears popping. They probably would have suffered from massive ear trauma. They could, you could actually survive for a few seconds before you die of asphyxiation and you die of being frozen. Yes? Um, can't the same thing happen if you go down? Like okay, let's talk about the bends. Oh, yeah. So, that. when you are diving, if you dive deep enough, what they discovered is that people that live down in Death Valley where it's below sea level or near the Sea of Galilee where it's below sea level, they have a slightly larger amount of nitrogen in their blood. Nitrogen, for us, it's not going to bother anything. But the higher the pressure, the more nitrogen sneaks into our blood vessels. Up here, at normal air pressure, normal, okay, um, not much nitrogen sneaks in. But the further down you go, more nitrogen sneaks in. Is it going to hurt you? No, it's not going to hurt you. So the diver goes diving down, sees a shark. Now you have teeny tiny little nitrogen bubbles. As long as you come back up slowly, those bubbles as you're breathing will go back out. But right now, there's a lot of teeny tiny little bubbles all throughout your body. If you see the shark and you panic, it took you five minutes to come down, you go up in 45 seconds. By the time you come up here, you're bleeding out your nose, you're bleeding out your ears, you're having a hard time breathing, your eyes are getting bloodshot. What happened? You did not allow the nitrogen to it got in slowly, it needs to come out slowly. You did not give nitrogen enough time to come out, so the higher up you went, the bigger the bubble, and it started rupturing your blood vessels. So when you get up on the boat, they have to race you to shore. All those shoreline uh, hospitals have hyperbaric chambers. They need to stick you in there pump up the pressure and then slowly decrease it in order for you to breathe the nitrogen back out. Max? Uh, didn't they aim to like solve that problem or help with it by pre uh, using a mixture of oxygen? And, and helium, helium, yes. And yeah. How does that... Deep, deep. Well, the helium is so teeny <laughs> tiny, it actually can get through the cracks in, in between your blood vessels. I mean, think about it, helium is the second smallest atom. And your blood vessels are made up of atoms which are a whole lot bigger and there's cracks between them. Yes? Apparently, when I was there, getting my scuba, scuba diving certification, they used to have these things on your BCD where if you needed it in case of emergency, you could pull this thing and it would be a big canister and inflate your BCD and you'd go shooting up to the surface. And my diving instructor, when he was diving, Oh my. Oh, by the way, how fast should you go up? What's what's the rule? Like one or three feet a minute or one foot a minute or something like that. What's the visual rule? Remember the bubbles. Yeah, you need to go up as as you're as you're scuba diving, you're you're releasing these bubbles. You need to go slower than the bubbles. If the shark bites your legs off, no big deal. You just don't want the bends. Okay? It's easier to deal with no legs and to have, no, I'm just kidding. Just, yeah. If a great white shark is after you, get the bends. Just leave. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that because they got a really old scuba diving thing? And they took all the pressure out of it and they actually did, like, they made a person out of an actual skeleton and they made blood vessels and all that. They did make his head explode. Oh. They actually made his head explode and one girl threw up because she's like, that is so disgusting. This is Mythbusters? Yeah. 
<laughs> okay. What are you converting to? PSIs to TORS. Now, TORS may not be on that list, but TORS is the same thing as as millimeters. Tours and millimeters are the same thing. It's all Torricelli's, so it's 760. Now here's a tough one. PSI 2 Pascals. Do we have a conversion to Pascals? No, we have one that still Pascals. Okay. People have a hard time thinking this through. 101.3 kilopascals. Okay, if you're a hundred kilometers, we know we need to move the decimal place three places. But sometimes people freak out because they don't know which direction to move the decimal place. Okay, a hundred kilometers is how many meters? A bazillion or is it a smaller number than really? Okay. A meter is about this big. How big is a kilometer? So you're going to need a bunch of meters to make up a kilometer. Well, what if you have a hundred kilometers? Okay, so you move it one, two, three. One hundred and one thousand three hundred kilopascals uh, in a kilopascal. Okay? Fourteen point seven. Okay, so last question. Breckenridge, Colorado, five hundred and twenty five millimeters of mercury convert to atmospheres. So tonight's homework, besides studying for the Sandra test, is really easy because where do you find these numbers? No, they better not be on the periodic table. Memorize them. Memorize them. Okay, so we learn how barometer works. We know the effects of altitude to atmosphere pressure. We learned why the 1968 Summer Olympics team for America was devastatingly bad. Actually, it wasn't just the Americans. Basically, all of the countries that compete at, at higher or practice at higher elevation did great. Everyone that practiced in lower elevation did awful. And we learned how to convert from one unit to another.